from the main index where the source type is access combined w cookie which is basically a web server access log for this time frame now i can double check it by coming here and then clicking on source type i see this is the only source type i see now the selected fields here by default it show up it shows up these are splunk's default fields every in the, every piece of data every event that uh, that we index <coughs> will have these uh, fields associated with it if there is no uh, no values splunk will add auto based on uh, you know its automatic configuration now i want to pipe this to a stats command count if i simply do a count it just shows me the number of records now i can do an order by by status let's actually look at what status is right now there is a status field here now if you if you guys know a little bit of web server um the web server logs every um uh hit every request that comes to it in its access log and then it also logs <clears throat> the url that the client is accessing and then how long the how long well how long it took the response time only you have to configure configure the web server to record it by default it won't be recorded but the status the http status is recorded by default 200 is the most common which means successful um, but 404 403 401 they are they are you know they are common in the sense those are standard uh, error codes um as a as an administrator of your application or even a developer sometimes it is helpful to look at the http statuses on your web server log maybe you are running into some 500 internal server errors these are deadly errors right the 500 series errors that means there is something going on on the application server that the request failed um most of the time it's like maybe an external database connection failed or the application runs out of threads or maybe a disk file system full or the application runs out of memory those are serious server errors so those are 500 series errors that the web server logs so it is useful to look at um the number of events based on the the status and all you need to do with splunk is pull all the events that are relevant which is basically index equal to main source type access command w cookie and stats count by status that's it now i know that 200 is the most which is great we have some 400 403 404 etc okay this in itself provides great intelligence right because now you know the breakdown um here's a beautiful part you can easily visualize that is by visualize this by going to visualization uh so this is the line chart i'm going to click on the select visualization here and then go to maybe a pie chart because pie is probably more uh, intuitive for this and that's it um <clears throat> just by one command or one spl you are able to break down you know what's going on with your um web server let me expand this little bit so it will be easy okay great let's run another command here um remember i mentioned about using or flag right code equal to d or code equal to e so let's actually run without it first so this is a vendor sales log and i have a code on each log event okay there are like 14 codes <clears throat> total uh what i want to do is to just you know capture i just want to see how code m and a are doing for example right so all you want to do is code equal to m r r caps code equal to a that's it now if i click on code here i know it's only m and a m is about 2000 events a is about 1900 events okay so you can use the r flag in this fashion let's look at uh, one more using uh, the wild card right let's look at you know yeah even within this let's say in here i want to look at the account ids that begins with um let's say 
Okay. So all you need to do here is account ID equal to seven star. That's it. Now if I go to account ID, I see all the ones that start with seven. Now you're starting to see how powerful and flexible it is, you know, to, to filter the data, right? This is one aspect of searching. You want to filter to what you want to get. Okay, so now yeah, let's do a more interesting filtering. So let's do access combined W cookie. Now the web server also happened to log the size of the response back to the client. And this can be useful, it depends on what the application is doing. Maybe the, some requests are so big, you are sending like huge amounts of data back um, and you wanna know what they are and you know how they are doing. Um, so the right next to the status code is the, is the bytes, right? The, the response time. Now, an important question here to ask is, this is not key value pair, right? 200 and 1665. But Splunk is able to um, extract the status correctly as 200 and then the bytes as this. So how does it do it? And this is where we talk about field extraction. Now by default, um, like I said, Splunk will try to extract as much fields as possible. The most common one is key value pairs. If it sees key value pairs, it will automatically extract it. So one thing to take away from this course is, especially if you're a developer, um, when you log data, see if you can have key value pairs, right? Splunk will automatically extract them without you having to do anything. The other way to do that is structured logs, JSON or XML. Splunk, with a little bit of work, well, I should say very, very little bit of work, um, it can automatically show, automatically extract fields from JSON and XML as well. But if you don't do JSON or XML, if you are sending raw data like this one, key value pairs is the way to go. I know some app teams, they have um, totally you know, structured their logging for Splunk with the key value pairs because it was so useful for them, um, right? Now, where we don't see key value pairs, now this is where um, what we call an add-on or app. If you recall, I mentioned app is used to parse the data as well. As part of parsing, it can tell Splunk to extract data based on you know regular expression or the location of the fields. That's what's happening here. So Splunk knows this is a web server log, and it knows um, that you know in this position bytes appear. Okay, that Splunk by default has that. If um, it, now in in I think maybe in this segment I'll show you how to extract your own fields. Okay. And that'll be useful. Let me uh, double check that. Is that what we are doing? Yep. Okay. I think we are doing a little bit behind the time, but we should we'll get going. This is important for you to understand. Okay. So now let's. Um, okay. Yeah. The, a little bit more interesting uh, filtering. You see the bytes here, right? You can do. Um, you can filter where the bytes is more than a certain amount. So all I need to do is bytes greater than, let's say 3,500. So now I only have these big, so to speak, big requests. I can tell, uh, if I look at the bytes, it's all more than 3,000 bytes or you know three kilobytes. Um, finally, you can, well, one second to final, you can use functions, if you remember what I mentioned. So now I know, um, the, I have all the bytes that are more than 3,500, but what if I want to find the maximum bytes that I sent back, right? That's where the stats command come into play. Stats, and stats has tons of mathematical functions. One of them is max. Max of bytes. So this is a syntax. Max within brackets, bytes. We already saw one aggregation called count earlier. So the count is just count. Uh, where is max, you need to provide a field value. So now here, or field name rather, max of bytes. Now I'm also going to add this as class. I'm just gonna say maximum uh, bytes transferred or something like that. 
Okay, so the maximum appears to be four kilobytes. Again, this is all test data. So, but you get an you get the idea. So within, um, imagine if you don't have a tool like this and you got to browse through your data and then find the maximum value. You can probably write a quick script, but once you index data in Splunk, all this is possible. And of course, you can you, you can still use the buy class here, and this is where it gets interesting, right? I'll say maybe buy uh, item ID, for instance. Why not? So now I have uh, 14 events for each item ID. I see what is the maximum bytes transferred. So now I can well, it's all kind of mixed, but you you see the power now of uh, using the buy class and stats command. Okay. Now, with stats command, you can chain as many aggregations as you want. So uh, we'll see this, and then we'll go into extracting fields, and we will uh, take questions. Here's what I'm going to do. It's the average of bytes up as average bytes. And then percentile 95. So. 95th percentile means it, uh, I recommend actually using the 95th and maybe even 99th percentile. So the percentile, the way it works, it's going to sort the values. In this case, it's being bytes from like 1 to 100. And then it will give you the value at the 95th position. Okay. So you can tell that you, so 5% of the bytes is more than that value. And then 95% of the bytes value is less than that. It's especially useful for average response times. If you look at, for example, average response time, um, you, you may be missing some ups and downs because it averages out totally, right? Whereas if you look at percentile 95, it can tell you if, um, if, if some of the users are experiencing really, really high uh, response times. So I'm just going to go and do this here, bytes. Yes. 95th person dial up. Oh, that's good enough. Let's go and run it. Okay. So I have, what do we do at the minimum to min of bytes? So minimum is 200, maximum is 4,000, average is around 2,000, and the 95th percentile is around 3.8. Okay, so stats is very, very powerful. Uh, like I said, just, you know, stats is going to be your go-to guide. So now let's look at how do we extract fields, right? This is going to be super important for you uh, because it, it, all that I showed you, stats and filtering, relies on you having, you know, usable fields. Otherwise, you cannot say, you know, stats max of this, max of what? You have to have the field name. Okay, so for this, what I want to do is look at the, the secure log. Give me one second, guys. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, so um, the W uh, date underscore W day equal to Sunday, okay? So basically, <clears throat> um, the date fields are automatically extracted for you even though it's not part of the raw data. So this is one of the nicest things. Sometimes you, it will come in very handy. If you want to exclude weekends, for example, you can do that. So here, let's say I want to look at only Sunday data, date, w day, date underscore W day equal to Sunday, it all shows up here. 
but um, I'm interested in actually creating a new field. Let's look at what, what, what we have here. So I have all these fields. Now I'm looking at the data here. And if you pay attention, there are some errors here. Failed password for invalid user app server. And then it has like, you know, failed password for invalid user, test user, and so on. Okay. So what I want to do is extract these user names so that I can find out who these people are and maybe look at the number of counts they are attempting, things like that. So in other words, username is always one of the critical fields that you can have in any type of logs, right? Access log, security log, audit log, because the username is a critical piece of evidence. But obviously I can see the username is not part of the fields. So how do I extract it? Now there are a few ways to extract fields in Splunk. Um, the, the method I'm gonna show you is using a wizard, okay, that by default, um, beginners use that. And it might work for most use cases. You can also use regular expressions with the command called rex. So that will be during search time. Just as part of SPL itself, you can run that command to extract fields. You can also uh, create a field extraction knowledge object by using the settings menu that still uses regular expressions. Okay, so in this demo, because it's a beginner's course, we will look at the field extractor wizard. And like I said, it may be enough for what you're trying to do. Okay, so the way I do that is first make sure the data that you want is actually showing up here. Now in this case, I wanna restrict the, the, um, the data to you know this string here, failed password, because this is where most of my failed password users are there, right? So now I want to extract this app server, test user, uh, you know, MongoDB. These are all the usernames, invalid user, right? So how do I do that? Go ahead and click on extract new fields at the bottom. What you need, the way it works, you give Splunk a sample event, and then you highlight the field that you want to extract, and then you give a name for the field. And then Splunk looks at the data, comes up with a regular expression, and then saves that. So that's how it works. So let's look at it. Um, for the first step is select a sample event. So what you wanna do is simply select an event here. I'm gonna select the app, this event, app server, the one that has app server, and then it, it selected it. Okay, then click on next. Now select a method, regular expression or delimiters. Delimiters is only used if your data is delimited correctly, like with a comma or a pipe. So in this case, there is no delimiters. You use regular expression. Now it is asking you to highlight the field. So I'm gonna highlight the app server. Once I double, you know, highlighted it, it wants a name. So I'm gonna say username, all in cap so I can easily identify it. And then click on add extraction. Okay, so now once you do that, <clears throat> it gives you some preview of all the value that it is able to extract, okay? You can also click on this username tab here to see all the value that it extracted. It looks good, but you can see some problem here. This IP address, IP address is not necessarily a username. So what you can do is uh, you can tell Splunk that the events that are you know not extracted currently, so it will exclude it uh, in the next step, right? So you're gonna click next. In the validate step, you're gonna um, basically um, click on this X mark for the ones that you do not want. You're telling Splunk that, okay, um, don't include this in the extraction. So I'm clicking on this. Okay, Splunk did this. Now let's look at um, all the usernames. This seems to be correct. App server, test user, MongoDB. Um, so the, the event that I excluded happens to be the, the, you know, the one with the actual failed password, not the invalid user, right? If you, if, you, if you pay close attention to this. This is what I want, the invalid usernames. Okay, so now this looks good. Click on the username and you can see all the usernames here. Uh, as you know, you can validate this. Awesome. So now